Good afternoon. We have lots of news to get to. But first, we have heavy hearts here today in our Washington bureau. In fact, around the capital city, Washington, grieving the loss of the legendary journalist Cokie Roberts. Cokie passed away this morning from complications with breast cancer. She was a fixture in Washington for decades and an absolutely brilliant icon here at our network. Here's more from Robin Roberts on Cokie's extraordinary life. She's been a fixture behind the news desk for over 40 years. We're following two major stories tonight. Reporting on the stories that shape generations. After all, President Clinton's problems with Jennifer Flowers were not just her word, it was tape recordings. Journalism was her calling, but politics, well, that was Cokie's passion. As a reporter and author, she trailblazed her way through an industry where women were just breaking through. Her full name was Mary Martha Corinne Morrison Claiborne Roberts, but anyone who knew her affectionately called her Koki. Thank you for having me, and please call me Koki. Well, I will, but I'm from the <laughs> South, too. Born in Louisiana in 1943, Koki Roberts was the daughter of longtime U.S. representatives Hale Boggs and Lindy Boggs, who collectively served the people of New Orleans for 46 years. The other women who were in Washington when I was growing up. We watched run everything. Uh, we watched them run the political conventions, campaigns. Through her parents, she enjoyed a front row seat to history and politics, which shaped her interest in Washington, learning the world of Congress the way other children learn to walk and talk. As a young girl, she considered to joining the family business. But in college, her interest in journalism was strengthened by her future husband, Steve Roberts. But her love and close ties to Washington were never far behind. President Lyndon B. Johnson famously even attended her wedding in 1966. She began working as an anchor in Washington at 21 and shortly after headed to New York to work as a reporter. It was essentially reporting and then writing very brief little stories and I loved it. Before landing at National Public Radio as a political commentator. From ABC News. But in 1988, she found her home right here. The American people don't want this to go on. But he for can't another do, year. and I didn't inhale, and I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't ever drafted. And I At ABC it. News, working as a contributor on This Week, Cokie's razor sharp mind. It's your definition of womanized. Most Sorry. women know it when they see it, Senator. Matched only by her infinite kindness when the cameras stopped rolling. Yeah. I have three cameras here. <laughs> you must be a very important person. Oh, and, <laughs> and always, always the smile, that giggle, her sense of humor. I can't see, but that ends it. <laughs> this week would become her home, co-anchoring the show with Sam Donaldson from 1996 to 2002. Until next week, that's this week. From there, she would become a staple of ABC News political coverage, interviewing presidents, politicians, and first ladies, embodying the idea of journalistic integrity and female empowerment. I hate to say it, John, but it's a female thing. Women do work together a lot. Uh, much more so than their husbands. Much more so than men. <laughs> thank you, thank you. She would write several New York Times bestsellers recounting the untold and remarkable contributions of women in American history. When I started out in the world of work, it was illegal for women to become generals or admirals. Uh, so there's a huge change in the years that, that I've been plowing this turf. <laughs> <laughs> Received countless awards, be cited as one of the 50 greatest women in the history of broadcasting, and hold more than 30 honorary degrees, inspiring students with words at commencements all across the country. You must look at the institutions of government, politics, business, the academy, and journalism, and hold them accountable to the people they are supposed to serve. In 2002, battling breast cancer and bravely facing going on the air wearing a wig. I felt um, first going on the air in a wig that I looked really goofy. And, um, and election night 2002, I, it was my best wig. It was the human hair wig, not the synthetic mm -hmm. wig. And I thought it just looked awful. Yeah. So I don't know, it's, so, it's, it's hard. Cokie, always the inspiration for those who had the privilege and were blessed to work by her side. She made each one of her fellow colleagues better by always striving for the best 
and by always remembering and reminding us all to keep the compassion in journalism. Thank you for your support. It's important. Cokie Roberts, the beloved mother of two, grandmother of six, and a legend to us all. And I'm joined now by our Martha Raddatz. And Martha, I know it gets me. We've been talking today about how Koki shattered glass ceilings and broke these barriers, but through it all, put friends and family first. Always. And my favorite quote from Koki was when she was first diagnosed with breast cancer and going through treatment at the time. And someone said, does this change your perspective? on life. She said, not at all, because I have always had the right perspective that family is first. She was, when I first met Koki, was at National Public Radio, and where they called her a founding mother, <laughs> which is a wonderful, wonderful thing to say and a wonderful example for other moms and other women to yeah. see a founding mother there and how successful she was, not only in her career, but with her family. I mean, she leaves a family that, like all of us, really worship Koki. Absolutely. And she took time to mentor a new generation of, of reporters, and especially female reporters. I felt like that. She took time to, to send quick emails of encouragement Meant yep. to invite you out to lunch. Um, a compliment from Koki meant more than anything else to me. I know. And and I, I, I love seeing how, particularly with the younger women in ABC and at National Public Radio, she was such a strong mentor. And I, I, I love what Terry Moran said today. She was truly a, a national treasure. She, she really was. And I know for the rest of my life, and I hope I can pass on to others as well, how much her advice, how much the shoulder to lean on, all of that meant to me, and her courage. Um, last month when she came on this week for her last appearance, and she emailed me afterwards that she was exhausted and didn't mean to be a distraction because people realized she was having health issues, and I said, the only distraction is that everyone loves you so much. I said, and I admired her because if she was going, if I was going through what she went through, I'd probably just lie in bed all day. Koki was determined to keep contributing yeah. every single day and have her voice heard, which we all sat up and listened yes. to. But more than anything, that smile, that laugh, that kindness. There are so many times on those round tables, often those round tables full of men. Oh, yeah. Where she would bring exactly the right anecdote or that fact from history that would ground the conversation, that would help me understand some of the biggest cultural stories of and, today. And, that's, and that was her gift as well, that she worked out. She, she knew so much. Not only had she experienced and lived it through, through a good portion of history, but she continually learned every single day more and more. She, I told her she knew more about politics, about life yeah. than all of us combined. Yeah. I mean, she really did. And she brought that. She earned everything she got. She earned it. She was never said, oh, Koki, let's let's have you do this. It was, and she fought for it. She didn't just earn it. She fought for it. You could sit on that round table with her and you knew when she wanted to get on. <laughs> and if you somehow missed it, you, you'd know really fast. She'd you, speak anyway. <laughs> even, even last month when she was clearly having, uh, having health problems. I mean, her voice was fragile. She looked a little fragile. Agile. I know our viewers were concerned, but boy, she got her points in there. That's that's the Koki yes. we all love in her morning today. Yeah, and it's not just us here at ABC. In fact, politicians from around Washington, uh, former presidents, putting out statements of support and grief. I want to read some of them for you from the Bush family. Deeply saddened that Koki Roberts is no longer with us. She covered the Bushes for decades. They called her a talented, tough, and fair reporter and a friend. The Obamas as well put out a statement. They wrote, uh, she was a trailblazer. And like we were talking about, they called her a role model to young women at a time when the profession was still dominated by men. Uh, it's true that she was there for shifting landscapes of 40 years. And she did mentor young journalists every step of the way. And her family put out a statement as well that we will read for you because her family is a part of our larger ABC family says that we will miss Koki beyond measure, her contributions for love, her kindness, and we are hopeful that Koki now goes to join her parents. 
you know, I personally was very grateful that Koki was always willing to talk publicly about the church and about her faith. That meant a lot to me. I want to thank Martha for bringing some of her personal stories to this conversation as well. But Koki, I think, would want us to continue talking about the news of Washington, and there is a lot to it. We're going to get to it right now. I want to turn to my colleague at the Pentagon, Louis Martinez, who has been covering all the ins and outs of uh, the aftermath of that shocking explosion and attack in Saudi Arabia. Louis, thank you for being with me. Tell me, what does the U.S. know right now? And is there really more evidence that these missile attacks came from Iran? Yes, Mary Alice, there's more information that's coming out about why the United States believes that these UAVs and uh, cruise missiles came from Iran towards, South, uh, towards Saudi Arabia. Uh, the information that we have now from U.S. officials is that they have information that, that pinpoints that the missiles and UAVs uh, were launched from southwestern Iran. Um, cruise missiles fly low to the ground. We know that UAVs can be directed to fly high or low. Um, and it's always possible that they flew low in this case so that they could evade uh, Saudi Arabian uh, radars as they went towards their targets. Uh, we're also learning that U.S. officials believe um, that they can recreate exactly what kind of missiles were used because they found lots of debris at the sites that were attacked, uh, indicating that these were Iranian-made uh, missiles and UAVs uh, that that we now know, uh, as many officials are telling us, uh, originated in Iran. And so they're, they're gathering all this information and they're trying to see if they can make it public. That's one of the things um, that's going on here. But the Saudis themselves are also carrying out their own investigation, uh, trying to get this information. Um, and then, as we heard yesterday, they're calling on international organizations like the UN to come in and investigate this because uh, they want to see where this all goes from here. And, Louis, it seems like the president has walked back some of that locked and loaded rhetoric from a few days ago. But do you feel like tensions are still high between the U.S. and Iran? Yeah, there's no doubt about it, Mary Alice. I mean, the tensions are still going to remain high, even though we saw that language yesterday from the president that seemed to kind of scale back things. Uh, at the same time, you know, you've got U.S. officials indicating, yes, this, these items did come all the way from Iran. Uh, there was a method, a method to it. This was a complex attack. Uh, we've never seen such a brazen attack uh, by uh, Iran towards another country. I mean, this was a direct attack against Saudi Arabia, and it hit them where it hurts them the most, which is their uh, oil facilities. This is the world's largest oil refinery, as we've all come to learn over the last couple of days. Um, so no doubt about it that the tensions remain high and that the United States really wants to see where Saudi Arabia goes with this. Uh, they want Saudi Arabia to step up uh, to pinpoint the finger at Iran, that they are the ones to blame. So far, Iran has kind of taken it uh, just to that point, saying that these were Iranian weapons, that they are, were not launched from Yemen, but they're not directly saying that they were from Iran. Um, and so uh, the United States wants them to move to that step, and then that'll lead to the next steps for the United States. You know, we work here at the Pentagon. It's a planning building, lots going on. And so we know that options have been presented to the president over the last couple of days. Um, but I think a lot depends on where things go uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia themselves and where they want to take this situation, because obviously tensions remain very high and it could be a much very difficult situation, uh, depending on which course of action is taken. Louis, thank you. And to Capitol Hill now, where the president's former campaign advisor, Corey Lewandowski, has been in the hot seat in front of the House Judiciary Committee. And I want to go to our Catherine Folders. And actually, Catherine, I want to ask you about who else was asked to be there today. The White House blocked two other former senior aides from testifying, and Chairman Nadler calls it an absolute cover-up. Yes, yeah, so as part of this hearing, the White House, uh, the committee also requested that uh, the former White House Staff Secretary Rob Porter and the former White House Deputy Chief of Staff Rick Dearborn show up uh, at this hearing today. They were also witnesses uh, in Mueller's investigation. Well, the White House sent uh, a letter on Monday night uh, saying that the two of them are actually immune from compelled congressional testimony. Those are the words uh, that the White House used because they were senior advisors to the president. Now, Corey Lewandowski, of course, the president's former campaign manager, uh, here a Tuesday today. He's testifying. Now, it's significant because he's the first person to appear publicly before uh, the committee uh, who wasn't um, a staffer at the White House. He was his former campaign manager. And also late last night, Mary Alice, the White House uh, sent a letter to the committee saying that they directed Lewandowski not to discuss any conversations he had with the president. So essentially asserting executive privilege over those conversations.
Yeah, yeah, but nonetheless, Democrats have been really grilling him about some possible conversations that he had with the president that are in that Mueller report. And a lot of focus on whether or not he conveyed any message from the president to a Jeff Sessions, who was the attorney general back then. Yes. Yeah, so one of the main focuses of the Mueller report, as it has to do with uh, Lewandowski, is that the president, uh, according to Mueller, asked Lewandowski uh, to deliver a message to Jeff, Jeff Sessions to uh, essentially limit the scope of the Mueller investigation. Now, uh, in the beginning of this hearing, uh, you, you could tell that Lewandowski had a bit of a strategy here. The chairman, Chairman Nadler, was reading from the report, and, and Lewandowski tried to stall. He said he didn't have the report uh, in front of him, and it, it, it was a little bit of a circus in there, but look, he's not going to talk about these conversations. I will say that one of the Democrats on this committee, um, Congressman Hank Johnson of Georgia, actually managed to get a little bit of new information out of Lewandowski. They're saying that he chickened out in delivering this message to Jeff Sessions, uh, but he told Johnson that he didn't, didn't deliver it uh, because he was on vacation with his family and that took priority. Catherine, thank you. I know you'll continue to bring us all the updates from that hearing room. Thank you. And now to the campaign trail where Senator Elizabeth Warren drew quite the crowd in Manhattan last night. I want to play for you a little bit of her speech. And Democrats can't win if we're scared and looking backward. We win when we meet the moment. We win when we stand up for what is right. We win when we get out there and fight. I am not afraid. And I want to bring in our campaign reporter, Cheyenne Haslett, who's there in New York. You were at the event last night, Cheyenne, and you heard the senator say that she thinks Democrats will win by moving forwards, not backwards. Did you think that that was a swipe at the former vice president? Yeah, that, that specific word, backwards, it's hard to think of it any other way. And what you're really hearing, Warren, used that same uh, language about not being afraid. She's used it in the past few days, and she said it on the debate stage there with Biden. But, you know, you're really hearing her amp up this message that her big ideas are worth it. And I think that's a way to try to convince voters that, like she said, they shouldn't be afraid to vote for things that people are painting as too hard or too big. And the way we saw her do it last night in this big speech that we're talking about 20,000 people estimated in Washington Square Park was she linked it back to this horrific factory fire that happened in the early 1900s that really that killed mainly women. And it had pretty strong overt feminist messages uh, to the crowd there about how it was women who worked from the inside on politics and on the outside organizing to try and make change and change labor laws after that fire. And Warren spoke to this in a way that directly compared that to her own strategy. And we don't often hear her talk so clearly about her own strategy, but she sees herself as the one who can work from the inside. And she sees this grassroots movement that she's trying to build as what will work the change from the outside. And that message again and again was about the women, the women who fought the corruption. So we saw her today, actually, uh, her event following that speech this afternoon in New York City was at NARAL, which is a women's reproductive rights organization. She held a town hall there. And so we asked her, you know, is this, are you using this moment to signal the importance of energizing women in 2020? So we'll hear what she said. It's the importance of all voters. Uh, I don't think anyone's been surprised to learn that I'm a woman. It's how we bring everyone into the fight. So you heard her saying that it's kind of a catch-all message, that she wants everyone in the fight. But we talked to a lot of women who really picked up on the feminist tones of her speech and of her event today. And one woman who was inspired enough that she actually switched who she thought she was voting for to be for Elizabeth Warren today. So here's what she said. I think only a woman can be President Trump. I think we have to have a woman. And um, a woman's place is in the White House. So that's what I'm definitely supporting. <laughs> 
Yeah, and that's a great dress that she's wearing too. But um, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was on a dress with all those Democratic leaders there. That was quite the image. Cheyenne, thank you for all of your reporting from the campaign trail. We're looking forward to the rest of it going into the rest of this week and this weekend. And we'll leave you today with the voice of Cokie Roberts talking about her and her career in her own words. Thank you. And you're going out into a world where the opportunities are vast. Uh, that you uh, have to keep pushing because uh, we need you. We need you to be there in the journalistic world. It's Mary Martha Corrine Morrison Claiborne Boggs Roberts. Wow, now yeah. that's, that is certainly some name. It's Catholic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the stories you will tell will be special and different because of who you are. But if you want to make waves, not just ripples, go into public service. You can look at the world around you and learn from it every day. Gene theory, really? I can't see, but that ends it. <laughs>